The HL Hunley submarine is the first submarine to sink an enemy vessel in combat. Um, that is the significance of the submarine. It's not the first submarine. It wasn't the most advanced submarine, even of its day in the 1860s, um, but it was the first one to do something. I always tell people it's a proof of concept that submarine technology could work. Uh, built in Mobile, Alabama, brought to Charleston in 1863, and after a number of months of training and preparation, they went out main attack February 17, 1864. They went out at night, and uh, the target was the USS Housatonic, one of the warships blockading Charleston. Charleston was under siege at the time, uh, and they were being strangled by land and by sea. And the Housatonic was one of the ships that they picked one of the ships blockading the harbor. It went out, made its attack, sunk the Housatonic, solidifying its place in history, and then it disappeared. It never returned back to the dock, and so it became a mystery. For 136 years, it was undiscovered. Nobody knew where it was. A great mystery in Charleston, in South Carolina, and in fact, of the Civil War. In 1995, with the discovery, began the process and the preparation leading to um, the recovery in the year 2000. That involved uh, preparing the building and getting the conservation facility um, uh, outfitted and getting the, the experts in here and the people who could really do a good job with not only the recovery, but the follow-up archaeological investigation and conservation treatment. And then I'll begin in the year 2000. Well, the Hundley is 40 feet long, three and a half feet wide, approximately four feet tall, with two uh, hatches or conning towers that allowed access for the crew. There was a crew of eight on board the submarine. Uh, the captain we knew beforehand, um, Lieutenant George E. Dixon, uh, he was in charge of navigating the submarine, steering the sub, uh, directing it towards its target. The other members of the crew were primarily tasked with powering the submarine. The way the submarine moved, it had a hand crank in the central crew compartment. Uh, each crewman would turn his, at his station the, the crank, and that would turn the propeller uh, at the stern. And so that's how they power the submarine. It was a very simple device uh, designed to be practical and accomplish its task, which was attack. Um, the submarine, was, uh, the, its method of attack, it had a spar mounted on the lower portion of the, of the bow, went out maybe 18, 20 feet. On the end of that was an explosive device. They call it a torpedo, but it, it was just a bomb. Basically, they were trying to sneak up and plant a bomb on the side of the Houstonic or impact it with a, an explosive device or a bomb, um, and then back away and, and return back to shore, idea being that then the next night they could get another bomb, go out there and sink another ship. The fascination of it is that it disappeared. It was a mystery for so many years. When the Hunley was discovered, it was discovered a thousand feet from the Houstonic, which is still offshore. Um, and starting with the recovery operation, its location a thousand feet from the Houstonic, um, taking that information, what we knew about it, bringing it back into our lab, and then um, our scientific staff began a detailed investigation of the submarine with one of the primary goals being to determine what happened that fateful night in 1864. We recovered the submarine in the year 2000. Uh, 2001 was the interior excavation. We removed over a thousand three and a half gallon buckets of mud, a lot of material. The entire submarine was uh, full of mud, which was excellent for us. As an archeologist, it's, it signaled, signaled we were gonna have some very good preservation, and we did. Um, so, looking at the artifacts, including human remains um, and the associated artifacts, and trying to put those into context, see what happened, how, how the crew died, for example, um, and looking at other clues that we find from the investigation of the artifacts, um, combine that with the information we get from studying the hull, um, will hopefully point us to a conclusion as to what happened that night. The, the crew is a fascinating part of the story of the Hunley. Um, if you look at the submarine, again, three and a half feet wide, four feet tall, it's a long, narrow tube. Um, getting in it, going out and making an attack uh, several hours, hours out, several hours back, putting your life at risk, knowing that if anything goes wrong at all, you will meet certain death. The first two crews of the, of the submarine died uh, in accidents during training in Charleston. And so you can imagine the third crew um, you know, they knew full well that everybody else who had worked on this submersible, this, um, uh, this submarine had died, and yet they were still willing to 
um, to join the third crew and take the submarine out and try and do something. The third crew of the Hunley uh, were from all different parts of the south and maybe possibly the north, depending. Four of the crew were probably most likely born in Europe. There wasn't a common thread that tied these guys together except for volunteering. The plan was to um, bury the crew of the Hunley uh, in 2004, to lay them to rest. And as part of the um, work leading up to that, we wanted to get a face associated with the names that we had come up with. Uh, the identities of the crew we knew, uh, we knew information about the artifacts that were associated with them, but we didn't know one of the things we wanted was to see what they looked like. Um, and so all eight of the crewmen had casts of their skulls um, used to make a facial reconstruction. And that's what we see here. It's done in 2004, uh, presented to the public before they were buried um, in April of 2004. If you're going to recover anything, especially a marine artifact, you have to have a proper place to uh, take care of it. You've got to have a lab. It cannot just be put, you cannot pull an artifact out of the ocean and put it on a dock somewhere. It'll start to, uh, to fall apart. What happens to artifacts that have been um, in a marine environment for extended periods of time? They absorb chlorides from the seawater. Uh, these chlorides are fine uh, to a degree if the object remains wet, but if you let it dry out, the, the, the salts will crystallize and destroy your object from the inside out. And so one of the primary tasks in dealing with marine artifacts is to remove these chlorides, um, which is why 10 years on, the submarine, the Hunley, is still sitting in a tank of water. This leads into what's going on behind me. Um, beginning last week, uh, we began a rotation of the submarine. The submarine was found 45 degrees to starboard. Uh, it was recovered in the same exact position. Uh, archaeologically, we did not want to disturb uh, the submarine. The submarine is an artifact, but it's also a site, and we wanted to basically lift the entire site off the seafloor and bring it into our lab to study, which we've done for the last 10 years. Um, and for the last 10 years, it's been sitting in slings that cradled it from underneath, hanging from a supporting truss. It, it was an excellent way to um, hold the submarine and support it over those years. Um, but as we move to the next phase of conservation, we need to remove the, uh, the nylon bags and slings that are supporting the submarine because the next phase will involve uh, submerging the submarine in chemicals and caustics. Um, and we have to minimize other materials in the tank with the submarine. Um, uh, because of their reactions with those chemicals. And so we have to remove the slings and come up, we had to come up with another way to support the submarine. And that way is rotating the submarine upright and setting it down on its keel. This will be the first time the submarine is upright since it sank. I've been with the project since 2000, since the recovery, and have done all of my work on the submarine um, with the submarine in a certain position, 45 degrees to starboard. Uh, we have preserved the sub in exactly its same orientation um, uh, as it was found. And now, for the first time, we're turning it upright. Not only was it amazing to see the submarine um, sitting again as it was designed to sit upright, it turned from being an artifact of iron sitting over, heeled over on its side. When we turned it up, it looked again like a weapon of war. It looked again like a submarine. In addition to that, um, the whole lower starboard side, which was on, underneath the sub, was largely obscured. We could not get a good look at it. A whole a one quarter of the submarine's hull surface was blocked. Uh, we could see par por uh, parts of it at a time by removing the slings, but we had never really got a continuous look at that part of the submarine. There were things there once we turned it upright that we hadn't seen before. So I, after the rotation, I spent uh, 20 minutes walking around the submarine. It was like a new submarine for me. I, you know, seeing things that I hadn't seen before. Um, and it gets your excitement going again, uh, you know, even more so. Um, and we're now chomping at the bit. Once the rotation is complete, they're still, you know, fine tuning it. Um, we're going to get in there and, and begin looking at these parts of the submarine that we haven't seen yet. That our ultimate goal is to, is to get it and its associated artifacts on display for people to see and really uh, make a personal connection with, with the submarine and the crew and, and what it did back in 1864.